And now for some bonus content. We've spent quite some time thinking about controversies and how to define consciousness, how to study consciousness, and how to maybe simulate components that might be important to consciousness. But let's say we build a system that seems not only intelligent, but maybe, just maybe, it's crossed a threshold into something more. What do we do? Asking this question isn't just musing about science fiction. As AI continues to develop, it is likely to become more and more human-like in its behavior. So, for example, you probably have had a conversation with a large language model, or LLM, or you know someone who has. Does it seem to you like someone is in there? If the answer is yes, is there actually someone in there? Do LLMs have theory of mind or ability to attribute mental states to others? Do LLMs have beliefs? Are they conscious? If we want to build a test for consciousness that targets phenomenal experience, it can't just test for neural correlates, intelligence, self-regulation, voluntary behavior, or any other capacity that might be associated with consciousness. It has to target subjective qualitative experience. It has to target whether there's something it's like to be that system, whether someone is in there. And this is a really challenging task. There are lots of capacities that co-vary with consciousness. Attention, perceptual organization, broadcast of information, ignition, higher order monitoring, and so on. So we might be tempted to create a test that focuses on those capacities as a means of identifying phenomenal consciousness. But even then, the primary goal of the test should ultimately be the detection of consciousness as such. And the detection of the related capacity would merely be a means to that end. It's also possible that tests may be system-specific. What works as a test on a human might not work great on another animal or an organoid or an AI. So let's have a look at some candidates for tests for consciousness in AI or just in regular old human beings. We'll begin with the classic, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, the Turing test. This was originally called the Imitation Game by Alan Turing, and is a test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable from that of a human. Note that I said intelligence, not necessarily consciousness. The test was introduced by Turing in his 1950 paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And the paper opens with the words, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? Many of you probably already know this, but just in case you aren't familiar, let's go through the Turing test briefly. In the standard interpretation, a human evaluator is supposed to judge natural language conversations between a human and a machine, where the machine is de designed to generate human-like responses. The human evaluator knows that one of the conversation partners is a machine and the other one is a human, but the human interrogator cannot see the other players and doesn't know which is which. In the original formulation, the conversation would be limited to text only or a computer keyboard and a screen so the result would not depend on the machine's ability to understand or produce natural sounding speech. Maybe we're getting close to relaxing this with large language models now, but for now, let's focus on the classic. The human evaluator sends a message to both players, and then the two players respond. And the interrogator's job is to figure out which is which, which is the human and which is the machine. If the human evaluator cannot reliably identify the human as human and the machine as the machine, then the machine passes the test. But the Turing test has been criticized as not really testing what it purports to test. One of the most famous criticisms is the Chinese room argument by John Searle. The thought experiment in the Chinese room argument goes like this. Imagine a native English speaker who knows no Chinese who is locked in a room full of boxes of Chinese symbols. And the English speaker also has a really extensive book of instructions for manipulating the symbols. Now imagine that people outside the room send in other Chinese symbols, which unknown to the person in the room are questions in Chinese. These are the inputs. 
And imagine that by following the instructions in the program or in the book there, the person in the room is able to pass out Chinese symbols, with our, which are the correct answers to the questions. So those are the output. Now imagine this room is so vast, so large, as to contain all possible ways that the symbols could ever be manipulated. So the correct output, however correct, is defined, it's always possible for the person in the room to achieve by following the instructions in the program or in the book. So why does the Chinese room argument undermine the validity of the Turing test? The program, the book that tells the person how to manipulate those symbols, this program enables the person in the room to pass the Turing test for understanding Chinese. But the person in the room doesn't understand a word of Chinese at all. According to this argument, passing the Turing test tells you absolutely nothing about the thinking or intelligence or understanding or consciousness of the entity in the room. It could be a zombie blindly following a computer program to predict output from input, but there is nothing proven or disproven about what it's like to be the person in the Chinese room. So to follow up this discussion and prepare for our activity, let's now hear from Anil Seth, director of the Sackler Center for Consciousness Studies at the University of Sussex for more on tests for consciousness, why they're so hard and how they should be differentiated from tests for intelligence. Hi, Neuromatch, I'm Anil Seth. Now the idea of testing for consciousness is super important. Ethically, it really matters whether something is conscious or whether it isn't. Now, to help us think more clearly about this, I like to distinguish between four different kinds of tests. The Turing test and the Garland test, and forward tests and reverse tests. So let's start with the Turing test. You've already seen that the Turing test is widely thought of as a test of whether machines can think. It's a test of machine intelligence, at least how Turing originally described it. Um, but as machines have got better and better at persuading us that they can think, it's become more clear that the Turing test, as it is classically described, is more a test of the human than it is of the machine. It's a test of what it would take for humans to attribute the property of thinking to a machine. That's a reverse test, a test of what it would take for a human to attribute a property to a system. A forward test would be a test of whether the system actually has the property in question, in this case, the ability to think or intelligence. So we must first be careful not to confuse forward tests with reverse tests. Now, what it would take for us to attribute a property to something is heavily dependent on our biases, on how important we think that thing is, and on our own human values too. We tend to see things through an anthropocentric and human exceptionalist lens, through the lens of being human, and we can attribute properties to things on the basis of superficial um, similarities. Now, that's forward and reverse, and that's a Turing test. The Garland test comes from the film Ex Machina, which you if you haven't seen, I, I really recommend you see it. It's written and directed by a brilliant filmmaker called Alex Garland. And there's a piece of dialogue in this film. It's one of my favorite pieces of film dialogue of all time. So there's this inventor who's created this potentially conscious uh, robot, Ava, and a, a stooge programmer called Caleb. And the, the, the inventor, Nathan, asks Caleb if he knows um, what the Turing test is, and they, they discuss that. And then they elide into, into consciousness. Uh, but then Nathan says to Caleb, there's not a real test is to show you that uh, she's a machine and see if you still feel she has consciousness. So here he's explicitly highlighting this difference between the forward test and the reverse test. But now it's about consciousness. The question is not, is Ava, is the robot intelligent? But the question is, is it, is she conscious? And it's important to distinguish these because they get so often conflated, both in academic work, but especially in the wider media and societal discourse in this area. You know, I see it all the time. There were discussions of open AI recently where in the New Statesman, which is a decent magazine, which was talking about um, their goal to build artificial general intelligence. And then it said, in other words, uh, whether 
they will build a conscious uh, machine. And it's like, no, they're not the same thing. Intelligence and consciousness come together in us, but because of our biases, we tend to conflate them. Intelligence, very broadly, is the ability to do the right thing at the right time, or, or perhaps a bit more formally to behave flexibly um, in the face of uh, changing and challenging environments. Consciousness is, of course, the ability to have any kind of experience. Now, they, they're they related. Perhaps uh, some kinds of conscious experience require some kinds of cognitive competence. The ability to feel regrets needs the cognitive competence to think about alternative actions. But at root, they're different things. The ability to feel and the ability to think and, and, and do. So a test for one is not the same as the test for the other. So that's our matrix of tests. We have tests of intelligence that can be a test of whether a machine has it or whether a person thinks a machine has it. And we can think of tests for consciousness, whether a machine or some other system has it and whether we think that other machine and other system has it. It's really important to know which kind of test we are talking about when we're talking about tests. Why? Well, one reason for this is the kinds of errors that we might make. Now, we can make false positives and we can make false negatives. Now, in the case of things like large language models, because of our susceptibility to biases like anthropomorphism, we might tend to make more false positives. That is to say, systems might pass reverse Garland tests uh, more easily um, than other kinds of systems because they play on our biases. There are other kinds of systems out there, let's say cerebral organoids, where the reverse might be true. We might be more susceptible to false negatives there because they play less on our psychological biases. They engage our projections to a lesser degree. So forward tests, reverse tests, tests of consciousness, tests of intelligence are related but distinct. And now for our discussion activity. Given what you've heard from Anil, and also given the material earlier today on differentiating intelligence and thinking from a qualitative conscious experience, now consider this. We've defined forward and reverse tests in this way. A machine passing a forward test means that the machine is conscious, and a machine passing a reverse test means that we think the machine is conscious whether it is or not. Okay, so now here is your discussion prompt. If a system, AI, other animal, other human, or so on, exhibited all the right signs of being conscious, how can we know for sure that it is actually conscious? How could you design a test to be a true forward test of consciousness? Head over to room one if you think you have some ideas for how to design a true forward test, or you want to try to think through that in this exercise. And head to room two if, given what you've learned throughout today's materials, you think that a true forward test might not be possible at all, and discuss your arguments with each other. Then we'll come back and share with the group. <laughs>